Hey guys, it's Eric Cronover from Nerdy Geek Talk, so for all your nerdy geeky needs, here with episode 21 of Holocron Herald. And as you noticed, I am not Luke. We're missing a Luke, but we are here with me and John. How are you doing, John? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. And we're going to talk about three episodes this week. Uh, Bomb Bad Jedi, Cloak of Darkness, and Layer of Grievous, which is a Moot Gunray arc, I guess. He's the only character that's in every single one, isn't he? Unless um, you count battle droids. <laughs> yeah, those don't count because most of them are destroyed in each one. Actually, you know what? There is No, there aren't any battle droids in the second one. There's only super battle droids. So no, even if you count battle droids. Like, I'm talking about like B1 battle droids. Yeah, There's yeah. none in the second episode because there's only super battle droids. But... We'll get to that. I actually uh, didn't notice that. <laughs> I, I did whenever they were doing the invasion. I was like, huh, they only brought Super Battle Droids. They did not bring any B1s. I just thought that was interesting. But the first episode is Bomb Bad Jedi. And if you couldn't tell from the title, this <sighs> is a Jar Jar Binks episode. Now, in all fairness, I just want to say right off the bat, I didn't think it, it wasn't as bad as I remembered, but I went in with lower than low expectations so in all honesty i actually was not disappointed i was just kind of like oh that wasn't quite so bad but i'm just saying i went in thinking like oh god this is gonna be the worst so take that as you will <laughs> what did you think about this episode it was like you said it wasn't as bad as i remember but it's still pretty bad i feel like you could just write down the major plot points of hey this planet doesn't want to be part of the republic and uh they try to make a deal with the senate uh, the separatists but um they decide not to do that due to due to whatever happens. And if you just write that down and keep that in mind going into the next episode, I feel like you can bypass I mean, this honestly, episode. Honestly, the only thing you... The, literally, the only thing you need to know from this episode, Newt Gunray got captured. For the this story is arc. true. That's literally it. You don't even need to know what's going on. Because this planet... This planet doesn't really show up after this, does it? Uh, I don't think it does. No, but you know what I realized? Is, th is this senator the guy that becomes a traitor eventually? Do you remember that? How there's a there's an episode way later in Clone Wars. I don't remember how much later, but in the Senate where uh, Anakin doesn't have his lightsaber, and but they're they're all the senators are trapped. It's like a lockdown. I think Cad Bane's there, and there's a senator that's a traitor. Is it this guy? I thought I don't it was remember him being a traitor. Uh, I definitely I, remember there being a Rodiant there, but I don't remember. It might not have been this guy. I just couldn't remember that. I that was when I saw this. But uh, as we mentioned. So basically, Rhodia needs help. Padme goes to help. Um, turns out that Rhodia is actually joining the Trade Federation, and so the, well, the Separatist Alliance. So he uh, he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna hand you over, Padme, to the the uh, Separatists. Sorry, but like, I need my people to eat, and you guys haven't done crap." Uh, and so they they get through that, and then Newt Gunray shows up. And by that point, the battle droids have tried to uh, arrest uh, Jar Jar Binks and C-3PO, and that has gone awry because nobody can defeat Jar Jar Binks. I, you know what's funny? I just realized that this episode could just be further plot points in the Darth Jar Jar theory. I'm just pointing out because they think he's a Jedi, so maybe he's a Sith posing as a Jedi. No, I'm kidding. But um, he... Defeats them, they keep going. Padme eventually escapes because she's Padme, and I actually liked that. I feel like you really could have just done this episode without Jar Jar, but hey. Um, you can do most things without him. But, um, but he goes through, tries to save her, she escapes, blah, blah, blah. And eventually, and oh, they think he's a Jedi. I, I forgot to mention, that's why it's called Bomb Bad Jedi, is that they keep thinking he's a Jedi. Ridiculous. Because, well, I, we'll get to that later when we go through the details, but... um. They eventually he makes friends with the worm thing. This worm thing basically saves the day, and they capture Newt Gunray. That's that's all you really need to know about the episode. But going through details wise, so at the beginning we have the quote: "Heroes are made by the times." Is that the quote? Yeah, that's the quote. I think. Um, why is why is that the quote? Heroes are made by the times. 
I think, I think it, it's because of Jar Jar is just it taking... Saying, is this going to say, is it saying that because he was pretending to be a Jedi, it's like, oh, he was a hero. I think that's... Kind of. I hated that the clones actually addressed him as general at the end. I was like, they shouldn't have known that he wasn't a Jedi, but whatever. Yeah. Um, I actually, uh, in reference to your um, mention of the Darth Jar Jar, I, <laughs> I mentioned that in my notes. Um, I think you just muted yourself. <laughs> Oh, there you go. I can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. That's weird for a sec. I, I feel like... um, Hold on. Uh, I feel like... At 120, I write that um, Jar Jar is already trying to kill everyone. Hashtag Darth Jar Jar. <laughs> because that's whenever he falls on the wheel or whatever. Oh my god, yeah, it literally starts out with that. Although, you know what I noticed really That's quick? That's a minute, the, 20 seconds in. The um the intro, there's, uh, there's like ships flying in space, and the CGI on some of those ships was really bad. Just for yeah. a shot. I noticed that, and I was like, the, the rest wasn't too bad in this episode. Again, this is the, the first season, so the animation gets much better as it goes on. But uh, that intro, there was just a specific shot where it was like, oh gosh, that was very, like, they could have they done that a little bit better, at least. Um, but I just want to point that out, that there was a really rough moment in the intro. It's like uh, just a split second, but I just want to point that out. And then, yes, Jar Jar immediately ruins everything and almost gets them killed right away. I was a little confused by the narration, by the way. Like, because if, if you listen to the narration... It talks about how she's going there to make sure that they stay a part of the uh, Republic. But literally, the scene after the narration, uh, she's talking to the um, uh, Chancellor Palpatine. And she's talking about how she's going to help a friend because there's families starving there and stuff like that. And it's a little confusing. I mean, she, I think she how was, they're connecting they, those two they, they need... I, I think they're foreshadowing the fact that they're leaving leaving the Republic because of the fact that people are starving and stuff. She's going mainly because she's like, hey, they need help. But I think the reason that they're, like, legitimately sending her is, like, they need to, like, I, we know they need help. So we need to make sure that they go to us for help, not the Separatists, um, I think. But either way, um, I do like how um, Palpatine specifically says uh don't use jar jar in the peace talks like please and then yeah. she's just like she's like okay yeah good idea <laughs> um, yeah then we find I wrote out that, down that notes too. i was gonna say then we find out that uh padme's uncle is a traitor which isn't very surprising i mean he's not a bad dude before you get to that um he says that um he says that it's the republic where was the republic uh, when we started starving or something like that. And then literally in the same monologue, he says, um, I know it's not your guys' fault. Well, no, no. He says, I know it's not your fault. I feel like that's him specifically saying to Padme. He doesn't say your guys' fault. Like, he says your fault. So I took that as him saying, like, like, hey, you could tell I'm mad, but, like, I know it isn't you that's doing this, but it's, like, your organization. You're really sucking right now. Uh, and I feel like he's specifically saying, I know it's not your fault, but I need to trade you in for food. <laughs> <laughs> like, basically, that's how the conversation goes. Uh, and then she's kind of upset, if you couldn't guess, you know, I feel like being traded. I mean, I feel like is right off the, I feel like she's, o I, I don't know. Uh, she, like, doesn't seem to have any sympathy right away. She's like, there's no other way. Like, what are you doing? I hope you think it's worth it. And I'm like, maybe it's a... I, I originally was going to say, like, maybe, I feel like she doesn't have any sympathy for him. But she definitely does at the end. And, like, right then, she's being literally imprisoned and going to be executed by... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Newt Gunray. So, never mind. I don't really think she's overreacting. She, she also... But I kind of feel like she was, though. Because she says... Um... What she say? She says that um, she says, uh, it's it's no life to live in fear or something like that. When literally the reason why he wants to leave the Republic is because he's living in fear, and the Republic's not helping. Yeah, 
I don't know. I feel like her. I I feel like it's reasonable like for her to be upset. Were... But they they could have they could have, I think, worded her dialogue a little bit better. Like it was a, just a little bit awkward that whole exchange. Thinking back on it now, but yeah. either way, it happens. Um, next thing I have is then we get the whole Jar Jar screwing everything up as the battle droids try to get them, smashes the ship and everything. And uh, my 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 only like note I had first off when this starts is why can C three PO move his head when he's on the magnet? He constantly is like his whole body is stuck. He can't move at all except his head. He keeps looking around. Just a small little plot thing. Like, is his head not made of metal too? I'm just pointing that out. Also, whenever he uses the um, the magnet thing to kill all the battle droids, they don't immediately get attached to it. Uh, their their bodies do stick to it. If you notice that, whenever they goes back to C3PO, like it it smashes them, but then pieces are stuck to that. Actually, whenever it, it focuses back on C3PO, because I thought the same thing. I was like, why didn't they all just get stuck to it? But it, as it rammed into them, it smashed them, and some of their pieces go did go on too. So I think the main okay, reason I didn't notice that. So I because I thought that too, but then I looked and I was like, no, there's like a battle droid head and I think a leg or something on there. So I was like, I guess there's there's some pieces, but that's what I thought too. I was like, why didn't it just like suck them up? But then I realized it's because whenever he drops C three PO later, you can't drop a bunch of armed battle droids and then expect Jar Jar to fight them. So that's the real reason. It's like, oh, well, they got smashed, but there are some pieces on there, so the magnet still works. Um, also, this is Jar Jar's first encounter with his future BFF, the the water worm thing, right? Or is that later? No, maybe maybe that's like he like the, tries to talk to it. I don't think he sees it yet. No, he doesn't see it. it. I don't think he's talking directly to that monster. He's just talking to the wilderness because they the wilderness doesn't like it. <laughs> the wilderness is a, just a metaphor for the audience, but um. Then I like how C-3PO, I, I was curious, he says, oh my goodness, this is all my fault whenever he thinks Jar Jar falls off and is dead after the crab droid comes in. Which I gotta say, I didn't think crab droids were that stupid. But, regardless... You forgot crab... something. What did I forget? Darth Jar Jar accidentally, de accidentally destroys Padme's ship. Oh, no, 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 I, I said that in the very beginning, right? But, or is that before? I guess I said that happened before the battle droids came in. It came. It happened after, didn't it? Was it before? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I can't remember. But like, I also have a question about that. How did her ship get destroyed here? If it's in Episode Three, uh, or is that just a similar I, I ship? I feel like that's make? just a, a, a uh, like a nice Naboo style ship. I think it's pretty rare. I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that. Like, hey, Naboo can afford more than one of these fancy ships like i feel like it, it could be a master yeah but i don't thing. think it ever explains that like i don't know i wouldn't be i, I like i, I don't know what you're think, saying but it doesn't i feel like we see it in the future like her ship in the future of the show and um they don't ever mention hey this is a new oh, ship you know or what she already got she already was using it in that arc we talked about before the malevolence arc and she got pulled in, and I don't think they... Did they use that same ship to escape later? Maybe they did. But I kind of don't think that's the ship they escaped on. Because if it already got destroyed... If it got left behind and presumably destroyed once, and now she has another one, I feel like it's reasonable to say, like, yeah, she's rich, she can just have another one. Like, you know what I mean? Wait, also, it got bombed in Episode 2, didn't it? Wait, that was a different one, though. That was What was Episode 2? Attack of the Clones. No, no, no. I'm talking about movie episode two. Oh, oh, oh. But that yeah, was a, it did get bombed. Or was that... I think that was actually a different model ship. I could be wrong. No, I'm pretty sure that that was, like, the same one. It's, like, the same model one, not I, the... I, I kind of thought it That's had, a good point, though. Yeah, but either way, I think it's reasonable. It was... Whether or not it was the same model, it was definitely, like, the same style. So it's it's reasonable to assume that it's a new... It's a Naboo ship that they have several of them so uh, but i have a is... similar issue what were you say what were you saying you cut out for a second there um i i have a similar issue in the third episode to this okay. one okay <laughs> um but then ctpo says oh my god it was all my fault when jar jar is like presumed dead 
how is it his fault? He literally didn't do anything wrong. Like I don't know, but C three PO is always a pessimist. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, he also says uh, Jar Jar's been killed. If only. Wait, does he say if, if only? No, I said that's me saying. Oh, that. oh, okay. I thought you said C three PO said if only. I was like, whoa. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. But like. Oh, if only. But then they go in the remains of the ship, and uh, they find a Jedi robe, which they, they hint at, like, that's Anakin's. Without a doubt, that's Anakin's. Yeah. I, I, and they hint at. My question is, does 3PO know? Because, like, I feel like 3PO kind of, the way he said, like, oh, I wonder who's that could possibly be. Or, like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know. I don't remember his exact words, but however he said it led me to believe, like, I think he knows who that is. Yeah, um, because he asks him, uh, Jar Jar asks him, like, who, whose it is, and his response is, first of all, the way he said it was weird, so I wrote it down, and he said, I wouldn't don't know. Really? Yeah, if you pay attention, know. he says, I wouldn't don't know, which isn't grammatically correct in the English language. That's actually kind of funny. Did he stutter in between? Like, I wouldn't. I don't he know. Kinda but... does, but like it's a, such a short stutter that it could be taken as one huh. sentence without. I feel a like they wouldn't write it that way without specifically intending it for it to be like. I feel like that's too big of a miss. Like they wouldn't write that, and then have that go into recording without being like, yeah, it's him being awkward because he knows it. So I, my guess is that yeah, three PO knows that's Anakin's robe. Yeah, but it was like it was the pause was so small that it sounded like it was like one whole sentence without a stop. Uh huh. But either way, I do like that little nod to the fun. fact that, like, yes, that is Anakin's robe. I did think that was a nice little detail. I actually appreciated that, especially that they didn't say it either, but that you know. Um, next thing. Oh. Yeah, like there's little hints throughout the series and stuff. Yeah, I like the. My next thing note is that I like battle droids. <laughs> B1 battle droids because you then you get that right after that you get Roger 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 because they're all just saying Roger Roger which I thought how was many funny. times did they say it because I, I don't considered know. <laughs> writing down how many times they said it but I remember it was at least 10 I know it was a lot <laughs> I was like man that's funny um then you get uh <laughs> and the next funny battle droid moment is when Padme's escaping which I thought was reasonable for Padme uh, it was Actually, a, a little. Oh wait, were you going to say something? It's, it's right after. Um, it's right after that when. Wait, wait, wait! You just you cut it out again, real quick. What did you say? It's after the. <laughs> you you totally just cut out right again, right after you said it's after. Sorry. Uh, it's after the Roger Roger moment that um, that he comes across his friend in the water. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, because he falls in. So, because as my notes, was... I have there's always a bigger fish. <laughs> yes, that little call. I, I appreciate that little call back to the Phantom Menace that you got there, which I I would have liked it if they actually showed some of the. Well, no, that was on Naboo. Never mind. I was like so showing some of the fish. I mean, it's not unreasonable to assume they could have some fish that are similar, but you know. Whatever. Um, but then we get to the next funny battle droid moment, which is while Padme's making her escape, which I thought was fine. It was very Padme-ish. She's, she's strong. She's She knows what she's doing. Um, and then you get, as she's shooting them and escaping, you get the one battle droid who's like, uh, where's the alarm button? And then he gets shot by Padme because he can't find the alarm button. And then he goes, oh, as he gets shot by her, which I just thought was pretty funny i also i just thought it was very funny that he couldn't find the alarm like you know it's very typical it's like oh here's escaping oh alarm's going off for everyone like ah but no this battle droid doesn't even know where the alarm button is which i just thought i was like yeah, that's really funny actually um i don't have much after that other than <laughs> c3po misses r2d2 <laughs> I like how he he says that he doesn't art he doesn't outright say it, but he says, Where's an R two unit when you need one? Which is just kinda like, Oh, I miss he's like, Oh, I need R two D two. Um and then literally the only other thing I have for this episode, because I feel like this is one we could probably skip over most of it, is that hey, we got to see Commander Gree at the end. I like Commander Gree a lot. Commander Gree is a cool clone. 
and that's the first appearance of him, but he's in the next episode. Do you have anything that's really important to that episode? I figured we'd kind of go somewhat quickly over the first two, because we both agree the third is where it's at for this arc. Second isn't bad, but the third is definitely the one I want to talk about the most. Alright, so, moving on to the second episode, since we have nothing else. Uh, Cloak of Darkness, that is the second episode of this arc, and... This is, is this episode 8? Is it 7, 8, no, 9 that we did? Um, or is it 8, 9, and 10 that we did? It's 8, 9, and 10, isn't it? So this is episode 9. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the quote to this one is, Ignore your instincts at your peril, which is definitely, uh, this one's pretty obvious, uh, d which the last mm -hmm. one was once I realized what it was. But this one is very obvious. It's talking about Luminar Unduli, uh, underestimate, not listening to Ahsoka and underestimating Asajj Ventress. Now, quick recap of this episode. They have um, Newt Gunray, and Luminara, Unduli, and Ahsoka are taking him, uh, basically back, they're going to imprison him, so they're escorting him back, and Captain Argus and, Gree, and Commander Gree are with them, and then, guess what? Uh, the, the Separatists don't like that, so Asajj Ventress is sent to either rescue or kill Newt Gunray. She does so, uh, she escapes with the help of uh, Captain Argus betraying the Republic. They escape with him, and uh, she even, she kills Argus at the end, and that's it. So, going through the details, which we'll kind of go through this one a little bit quicker, too, because the third one's awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. First one, why is Ahsoka away from Anakin? I don't know. That's happened several times uh, throughout the series, but they always like have an explanation for it. Like I remember the only other one that I can recall right now is whenever um, she's too uh, too. Uh, that I forget specifically what it was, but she was um, she did something wrong, and because of that, um, she was assigned to be in the library. Oh, I was thinking, I know the other episode is where she's with uh, Luminari Unduli, who she's with in this episode, her apprentice, Barrow Safi, in the mind. Well, there's a, an explanation for that, too, because that... Um, oh, Anakin and them stay. That's right, on GNS. Yeah. While they leave. Okay. But yeah, this yeah. one, this one they don't seem to have an explanation for, which I guess it's like... I don't. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting, like that they don't. They don't even bother giving a reason. It's just like, well, I guess it's like, hey, give my paddle on to Luminar and Dooley. I don't know. It maybe. could. It could be explained as like maybe the Jedi um, occasionally will lend Padawans to other Jedi masters um, just for like a little bit of extra experience, like get, uh -huh. getting their minds more well rounded of like being taught something. Yeah. By someone other than your the someone that you spend most of your time with. Yeah, I do think it's interesting. I just I was just curious what it would be. Um, yeah. Next note I have is I just love Captain Commander Grease design. I love that. I love that clone commander design so much. I'm just pointing that yeah. out there. Again. Um, I actually really really love um the oh, the setting uh, commandos. The, that that and the uh the the consular class cruisers. Uh, and yeah. I really like the feeling of, like, the compact feeling that they showed. Um, like, I really like it whenever ships like that have a very small cockpit. Yeah, I thought that, that was cool. Um, then... oh, you, you... I did... Have we seen the Senate Commandos before now? No, this I believe this is our first intro to them. We will and see why are them. they here? Like, on the ship? I think Shouldn't it's... Just they... being... They're, I that? think it's because they're uh, my guess. This is kind of a stretch, but um, he's a former senator, like uh, Newt Gunray the, is. The so, so I'm assuming, oh. yeah, Newt Gunray is. So I'm assuming that he's like a political. He, if he's a political prisoner, I guess it kind of makes sense that the Senate would want him, because I think he's gonna be brought before the Senate, not necessarily go straight to prison. So that's my guess. So he's gonna be brought before the Chancellor. Because he is the Senate. <laughs> Essentially. But uh, <laughs> the next thing I have is they don't they don't treat their prisoners very nicely, which I, I New Conray is a bad guy, but like Commander Gree is like hitting them over and over. And I'm like, that, he's abusing his prisoner. Again, I don't remember dude, that. But... He, he hit him like twice. Like not super hard, but he was just like move and like just like hit him. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I thought you meant like 
full on like a no, 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 no. He doesn't like it. full on like punch him in the face or anything. But he like hits him. Like he hits him in the back. I I want to say he kind of hits him with his gun, which I was like, that's kind of harsh. But you know, whatever. Uh, next thing I have. Okay, so Dooku. City Dooku is like I'm gonna send Ventress to do this, and Sidious because Sidious is like this is really important. Dooku's Dooku's like all right, I'm gonna send my assassin, and then Sidious is like, uh, you sure? Like she's she's failed over and over again, and this is important. Like you you can't mess up. Duke is like, don't worry, she's my good assassin. Like she gonna do this. <laughs> Hangs up. This is only assassin, isn't it? Uh, yes, yeah. But he's like he, he, he's like <laughs> she's my good assassin. No, no, I meant like she's a good assassin. But uh, well, she's not okay. his only. She's not his only assassin that he will ever have. But she's his I'm only one that we know of right now. At this moment, yeah. That we know of. In all honesty, the fact that your places are so easily later, I wouldn't be surprised if he has several others, to be honest, that we just never well, learn about. Well, but... whenever he does uh, try to kill her off, he goes and finds a new apprentice. Yeah, well, see, that's the thing, because I find it very interesting, is that the word changes the instant he hangs up with Sidious. Because he doesn't use the word assassin anymore. Then he starts saying apprentice. He's like, if you want to be worthy of being my apprentice... Well, that's because he's this. kind of yeah, plotting, plotting against Sidious. Yeah, so I thought yeah. that was interesting. I just, I just, I liked that little bit in there that they, that attention to detail. That it's like, yeah, he's he's very much aware of the fact that there's a rule of two. He's kind of training apprentice, and then the fact that this will come back to bite him later because, yeah, he's clearly training her to be his apprentice, and Sidious ain't gonna have none of that later. But that's not for a while. So we'd get our first hints at that now, though. Um. And I gotta say, she Ahsoka actually... goes crazy for for no reason oh, as well. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So I have that next. I said, "Holy crap! Uh, good cop, satanic cop." Because it wasn't even <laughs> bad cop. Like she, Lunar's like, you know, I could see that you have all the stuff we need. Like you're you're gonna like this isn't gonna go well for you. All that, and then. Ahsoka's like, I'll kill you, like, points her lights at, like, more <laughs> aggressive than Anakin ever is. Like, Anakin would be pretty aggressive. He's never even that aggressive. Like, that was, I like, know. bloodthirsty. And then the best part is that it works. <laughs> because yeah. then he gets up and he's like, okay, uh, want to wanna talk about me negotiating now? And I'm just like, that's actually kind of funny. I don't know how I felt about it. I thought I thought it was funny. I was just like, "Holy crap!" And the, and even Luminar is like, "Holy crap! What are you doing? Like, you can't do that." And she's like, "I didn't mean it. Like, I was just, I like, I'm just wanting to do it." And then it worked. So I was like, "That's kind of interesting." I just thought that was funny. Um, my next note. This is just really. This is a very small detail. You probably you probably didn't notice, but um, whenever the droids are boarding. And the super battle droids, which I did mention that there's uh, only super battle droids. There's no B1 battle droids. Just interesting. Um, when they start fighting the the green the green clones, uh, there's one clone that specifically actually picks up two blasters. Like we get to see a clone dual wielding these blasters, which I I just want to point out we've never seen that before. I never noticed that before. I just thought it was cool. Yeah, um, I didn't notice that. Yeah, he actually dual wields like these blasters, <laughs> which is something you only see them typically do with pistols. It's very rare that you see a clone dual wield like regular blasters. So I just wanted to point that out that if you look, there is a clone that does that. Like there's a, the I think it's the first clone that gets shot dies, but then the one behind it picks up his blaster and starts dual wielding. And I was just like, that's actually kind of cool. I wish they would have like showed that a bit more. Um, but anyways, then I have so I I just put that in as a neat little detail. Then I put Ventress is good. Um, yeah. Um... I, first of all, before you get to Ventress and her um, uh, acrobatics, uh, the I really like the droid. I think they called it 327T, <laughs> yeah. the, the flashlight eyes. Um, for whatever reason, I've always liked that design of droid, and we don't really see it, like, ever. Like, it's yeah, very not, rare that we see it. Not very much, yeah. But... I've always liked that, like, the simplicity of that droid. I like that he wanted to be called by his full name. Like, he was very annoyed that the clone didn't say the T at, his, at the end of his name. I thought that was <laughs> funny. Um, but one thing that actually happens before that is that Ventress decapitates a clone. And she, uh, she takes... Um, did you notice that, that she takes the wrist gauntlet then? She has it the whole episode? Yes, yeah, I did notice that. Because um, she uses it and, later, but she has it the whole episode. She gets it then, like, definitely from the one she decapitates, is my guess, so. Yeah, because, like, 
she decapitates him, and then literally the next scene is her crawling into the the vent with it on her arm. Yeah. Um, so my question is, because I did think about this when I was watching the episode, what do you think of like Jedi and non clones using clone armor on themselves? So the the main character that does that that I can think of is Obi Wan. Yeah. Um, I think it makes sense. I will admit um, though, Kanan um, kind of does that. His his well, one arm has not, armor on it. Say, that's not clone armor. Reminiscent do, to clone. But, yeah, I was gonna say it is armor. It's I similar. like that. Like I like that it's different. Like you know what I mean. I I love like I love clone armor, but um, I think it. I don't know. It makes sense for the Jedi to wear it, but I prefer it when it's different armor. Like, I love Kanan's because that's not clone armor. Like, it's similar, but it's not, especially the shoulder pad. Like, I like that. Whereas, like, Obi-Wan's just wearing white clone armor. I'm like, that's kind of boring. And then throughout the series, the the Jedi wear their robes. Like, Obi-Wan ditches the clone armor. He doesn't have any of it. So I don't know how I feel about it. I feel like in a practical sense, it like, yes, it makes sense in, in like that. But I really don't care for it that much i don't hate it but i don't care for it unless it's different you know what i mean yeah it's it's interesting to say the least yeah i think it makes sense like in all honesty i don't know why they don't wear more because uh like they could just get hit by a blaster bolt and if you're wearing clone armor i feel like that that's a little bit better than just getting shot in you know like the <laughs> cage or something although it does restrict some movement but like wrist gauntlets not all of them even wear wrist gauntlets. Like I, I feel like that is one that usually that makes sense. Like Mace Windu wears the the wrist the the arm gauntlets. That's it. I from clone armor, uh, and that makes yeah. sense. But like Anakin doesn't, which he doesn't need to for his robotic armor design. Like I feel like it would make sense to, but I don't know. I just find that interesting that some do, some don't. I think Kid Fisto I'd like to point out so. that um, if I had a robotic arm, I would try to like, especially with his tinkering nature do something with it to make it do cool things rather than just be a robotic hand. Oh god, I would go the general grievous route, but we're all we're not all freaks, so Um yeah, I <laughs> But I am with you. On That's that. next episode though. As you say I would tinker with it. But yeah. Um I don't really have much other than uh Ahsoka wants to kill Ventress, like, f straight up. She's just like, I want to kill you. I don't, like, she doesn't literally say the words, I want to kill you, but she, like, literally says somehow, I forget her exact wording, but she's like, I'm going to kill you, basically. Just, just like, man, she is, she's feisty. Yeah, um, I do have, uh, some things, like, for instance, um, uh, Ahsoka... Before she came, uh, before Ventress came to go get, uh, uh, Viceroy, um, uh, she, uh, she boasts that the droids couldn't take over and, and, uh, rescue him before she's told that they were able to fend off the droids. Hmm. Like, she boasts about that, and then the guy comes and, and says, hey, we were able to defend off the droids, or whatever. Yeah. I thought that was kind of weird. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure she knew, like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna stop. Like, I think that was just her confidence, but I don't know. Like, I don't think that was yeah. her sensing anything. Like, I don't I don't think that was a screw, but I think it was just show, showing that, like, she was confident, like, yeah, we've got this. <laughs> Even though they, they don't got it, if you weren't aware. Uh, they, they, as I said in the recap, he escapes. Um... I also have um, uh, uh, what were you gonna say? Oh, my mine was like the next event, so you can say yours. Yeah, I also have uh, whenever I kind of feel like the roles should have been reversed with and pertains to Ahsoka and um, Illuminara. Uh, I feel like ah ah Ahsoka should have been the one that wanted to go at it alone, but Illuminara would be like, "No, we have to stick together." Because it's been a pretty constant thing to have the Padawan want to do things on their own and um, the Masters knowing that they have to stick together in order to do something like True, in episode in all, two say, and the all, next episode and stuff like that. Yeah, but uh, in all fairness, uh, Luminara is a, a Jedi Master, so I feel like it is reasonable that she's like, I can take down this stupid like assassin but like there no one not even Ahsoka thinks that she can beat Ventress alone 
But like Luminara, yeah. I, I feel like it is reasonable that Luminara thought she could beat her on her own. But I do see what you're saying about the lesson and stuff. Like I'm not saying that it's not reasonable. I just feel like it's a little bit out of uh, character. Not out of character, just a little interesting that she isn't like that. Whereas most of the other masters that we've seen are are like that. I, I do kind of like it though because then it also plays to the arrogance of the more elite Jedi in the Jedi Order uh -huh. that kind of led to their destruction. Yeah. Also, I do want to point out that this is our first episode, our first introduction to Luminara, and she's important to events long even after Order sixty six. Just putting that out there. She, yeah, she, comes she up shows. Kind of comes up in Rebels. We'll see. Kind we'll get, of. We'll get to that in um, a while. A lot. Would you consider that an actual appearance? Because technically, yes. she's not really. Yeah, we'll get there. It's okay. complicated. <laughs> that's that's what we'll talk. That's what we'll say for now. Um, we we'll just go through. Uh, my question is: Why doesn't Ahsoka try to cut through the wall when she gets locked in the cell? Like, I she, thought she, about she that because, the like, the field. emitter. Yeah, the yeah, why emitter. Did she, why didn't she cut the emitter? Yeah, that's could why easily I'm... have been cut. But I mean, in all fairness, she's in there for like twenty seconds, so it's not that bad. But that is my first thought: was like, why did she try to hit the force field when she could have literally just slashed at the emitter? Or even if she couldn't hit it with a single slash, like cut through it. It is a thick wall, so I guess, and maybe like because it is a prison cell, maybe it is lightsaber resistant, but. Maybe. Why Why wouldn't they just show that is my question. Or maybe so, it's kind of like Kylo Ren's lightsaber, whereas um, even though the emitters for the uh, the cross guards are thick enough that a lightsaber blade could hit it and destroy it, but the blade actually still is through. still... Okay, yeah. that's fair. But still, maybe. she could have cut through the wall next to it, so I don't know. Yeah. Like, even not hitting the emitter. But either way, she's in there for 20 seconds, so it's not that big of a deal. So it's kind yeah. of reasonable. Um, then I have Gunray. <laughs> I like how Gunray actually gave good advice. He was like, I don't, uh, I don't, wh I think what he said is, um, I don't save anyone. Uh, I don't put my skin out there for any, like, I don't put myself out there for anyone unless I absolutely have to, basically. And that wasn't exact words. Um, but <laughs> if, if, I, she, I did like that quote. if she would have listened to him, he wouldn't have gotten away. <laughs> Because she was specifically, yeah. that's what she's talking about. And uh, and then Argus says, uh, a good soldier does what he thinks is right sometimes, even if that means not following orders. And so she goes off. But if she would have listened to him, she could have easily stopped it, and he would not have gotten away. So I think it's funny that Gunray's own advice would have actually prevented his escape if she would have listened. So I just thought that was funny. And also very in character. You mentioned... Her. You mentioned something that's in my notes, actually, and I want to ask you about this because this is something I thought about. Whenever that clone trooper says um, uh, the thing about the good soldiers, what it, like you and I have a different opinion on what a good soldier is or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, agree. Whatever it was, it, uh, it immediately made me remi uh, remember about the good soldiers follow orders thing that – some clones um, uncontrollably say during a plot point that's a major Much part later, of yeah. Star Wars. And it kind of like, I thought it was interesting that even yeah, I don't back think here, that was, I don't think the that idea was of what a good soldier is is still imbued. Yeah, I feel like that's just as a someone very, that follows orders. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like that's a very clone thing. Like, I don't think they were specifically trying to set up that story yet. But. I do think that. But in a way, it kind of does. No, no, yeah, it, de it definitely does because it fits into the clone. I think they were just trying to fit into the clone characterization, and then that story is an extension of the characterization of the clones. But yes, you're right. This is essentially our first little nod, albeit I don't think it's like was flat out intentional. But yes, yeah, it could have easily been an accidental could... nod. Yeah, but I, I'd say that this is like our first little thing that you can take as support for that story arc towards the end of the show. It's one mm -hmm. of the last ones. Um, but the, the, they're like kind of programmed in a way. Yep. So like it's it's cool to see that, yes, they are programmed to follow orders, you yeah. know. All the way back in season one. Um, I thought you were going to say that Argus was a clone, actually, whenever you were saying that. Because I thought you were going to say what, uh, like talking about the line that says good soldiers some do what they think is right sometimes. I, I was like, you know, no. he's not a clone. Uh, but yeah. 
So then they have their little face off, and then Gunray hits Green in the back of the head with a gun and knocks him out in his fight with Argus, which he was winning. Um, as a child, I hated that moment so much. Like it really, really upset me. Like I, I really loved Gree. I still love Gree. If you couldn't tell from me saying that multiple times, um, <laughs> so that really, really bothered me that Newt Gunray took him out. It's almost like, the, just really quick tangent. It's he low, was low, distracted low. though. Yeah, no, I, I. It's not unreasonable, but still, it just bothers me. It's like in Transformers Three: Dark of the Moon, Starscream, who is Megatron's second in command, gets taken out by Sam Witwicky. He gets killed by a human. And I hated that. It's not the same level of like, oh my god, that's stupid. But it is one of those things. Where no, I'm just I like, feel oh. like that's an even higher level of, oh my god, that's stupid. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. I'm saying no, no. Because I'm, I feel I'm like saying it's that that's a... worse. I'm saying that the moment okay. in the Clone Wars wasn't as bad. Yeah, I'm saying that is way worse. Um, and I'm saying that that's kind of how like it, it makes me do like one of those face palm ones where I'm like, just like, why did it have to be someone that terrible that took out? someone that I like, like, you know what I mean? So it's not unreasonable, yeah. but it just really bothered me as a kid. I feel like, um, any transform transformer being taken out by a human, like one human is, is just a pretty absurd idea it's, to get your head not around. A soldier. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah, exactly. star scream, which I don't know that character very well, but the little I know of him from like the, the cartoon transformers prime that, you're having me watch with you uh -huh. and um uh go watch that podcast that we're doing by the way yeah, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh like the little i know from from that and from i'm not counting the movies as a credible source but that that is a source uh i feel like that's even bigger oh yeah absurdity it, it's, it's well. absurdity it's just that's what it reminds me of but yeah yeah. Um, and then the only we're thing, a little off topic now. Say the only thing I have other than that is that Argus dies. Which my question is, why didn't he? I feel like if he would have killed Gree once he was knocked out, he could have stayed. But then you know what I just realized? Um, Gree, Gree said over the comm link that he was a traitor. So never mind, he couldn't stay. But I'm just wondering because yeah. like he could have stayed um, as an agent. But no, never mind. So there was basically no reason for him to get out. Um, I, I love the ruth the ruthlessness of Ventress whenever she kills him. By the way, uh huh. I feel like that was almost unnecessary. I mean, I guess it does show how ruthless Ventress is, which is very interesting because that is very much not where the character ends up. She, she has a very interesting story. Oh yeah, I love her story throughout the show. It goes even farther than the show. Too. Yeah, but in like canon, but... still. Oh no, no, it's very general. interesting in the show. But I'm just saying that it goes even farther. With characters in the show that go even farther, it gets weird. But um, I do have a question though. Yes. They le they mention at the end of the episode that they can track this ship itself to find um, Gunroy. Um, mm -hmm. How come whenever they go to the signal that they're tracking, they don't? Like, where is the ship? Like, did they take the transponder out of the ship and I think they like, knew put it that, in the? Like, I'm I'm assuming that they layer? knew, like, hey, there's a there's a transmitter in the ship, and that once they got to the layer, they either just hid the ship somewhere in a dock, or they destroyed it, and then they took the transmitter with them. Like, I I don't think that's super unreasonable to know. Like, that battle droids would be able to find it. I don't know though, but. Either way, as you mentioned, so last episode of this arc, Layer of Grievous. This is the really good one. Um, yes, it is. I would say that this is my favorite episode of season one. It's one of my favorite episodes. Um, yes, it's a it good is. one, but it's it's also focusing on Grievous, which is something that I I love love Grievous, and this is the most packed story I think we ever get from him in the show. Yeah. Um... There's a lot of imagery in this that kind of hints towards um, his backgrounds and stuff like that. That's really, really good. And it's also interesting because it does seem to be a bit different from Legends, but a we'll little get there. bit, but we'll get there, yeah, um, yeah. And I have a question about that. Whenever we get to that, so mm -hmm. like what you what you think on something? So uh, overall recap is uh, Kit Fisto and Nadar Veb are sent to. Uh, find the ship, like from Luminari, and to find Gunray. Basically, they track it there. So they're the close. They're the ones who are closest. So they go. Uh, 
find out that, hey, he's not here, this is actually a trap. But then they, they set by Dooku, but then they realize that, wait, this isn't a trap for us. This is a trap for Grievous. Uh, and Grievous utterly destroys all of them except for Kit Fisto, who escapes. But I would say somewhat narrowly. He doesn't make a... It's not like a, oh yeah, that was easy. Like, he, it's, it's, he gives him run for his money. But, um, that's about, that's, that's the main parts of the episode. So now let's dig into this one. Cause I that was it. a really quick recap. I mean, in all honesty, like, there isn't a whole lot of important events other than that. That Oh, he, he kills, like I said, he, he destroys everyone, but he specifically does kill Nadar Veb as well. Um, yeah. Um, but, I like the idea of, well, first of all, we, uh, we did you say the quote? No, that's what I was just about to say. Uh, most okay. powerful is the one who controls his own power. So basically, this is talking about how Kid Fisto is all about restraint, and Nadar Veb is not. Yeah. Um, first of all, anytime you see Kid Fis Fisto is awesome. So another plus here. And I actually kind of, what do you think of the idea of Nadar Veb? Because I actually kind of like it, and I'll get more into why I like it um, whenever we get to it, but what do you uh, think of him? I I like him. I think they kind of made him a bit not likable. Like, not 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 likable, but someone, I don't want to say annoying. I don't know. I don't think they gave him a whole lot of sympathy, and so it was more of an easy kill at the end, like, if you know what I mean. But yeah. I did. I did like the contrast he provided to Kit Fisto. Like I feel like there, it would yes. have been more emotional of a death if they either made him a more sympathetic throughout the episode. Although he was kind of like you can understand where he's coming from, but he still seems somewhat rash. Um, or yeah. if he would have appeared previously, although there aren't that many episodes previous to this, so that there was just somewhat of a background to understand. But I thought it was very well, interesting that Kit Fisto didn't finish his training. They mentioned that. Well, the well, part, that's partly due to the reason of the war, and they needed to get more Jedi out there, uh -huh. um, so that they they rushed his training. But um, uh, I feel like uh, the part of the reason why you don't really feel his death is because um, there's literally thousands and thousands of Jedi, mm -hmm. and so you don't really feel the weight of a death of a Jedi because. Really, one death of a Jedi is really minuscule. True. I'd argue that the character deaths in the Clone Wars, that there are Jedi deaths, but that, honestly, the most emotional ones are not Jedi. Yeah. Um, They're usually clones like, or a, a love interest that I'm thinking of. But we'll get yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, one thing, interesting thing to notice is that, yeah, Nadar's a former Padawan and that he his training was rushed so he finished so he's actually a knight i thought that was very interesting that they didn't bother to finish his training because of the war i just thought that was interesting and then it kind of shows throughout um oh yeah but then it says well, yeah the war prevented me from seeing through your training um i have a question about the troopers <laughs> yes are they veb's troopers or uh fisto's because he doesn't arrive fisto doesn't arrive with the troopers the troopers are kind of with veb but I kind of feel like he wouldn't have his own troopers yet. Um, in all fairness, he is a Jedi Knight, and so is Anakin at this point. So I True. Feel, so I feel like it is... But, but he it, just became yes, a but knight, in all wasn't fairness, he? It's also... Well, we didn't even see Jedi... I mean, Anakin become a knight either, so I don't know when he actually became a knight. Oh, um... Uh, he didn't... It's not that he didn't finish his training... It's just that Kit Fisto himself couldn't see the finishment of yeah, his yeah. training. Yeah, he didn't yeah. finish his training. Like Nadar Veb finished his training, but Kit Fisto was not the one. An, who at least it. enough to become a Jedi Knight. Yeah, um, but he's still very much a young Jedi. But it, in all fairness, um, not every clone has, uh, not every Jedi has their own specific battalion assigned to them. Like o Obi Wan does, Rex does, but not everyone does because um, we see that. Uh, like I said, Gree, he was with Luminar and Dooley. He's with Yoda later, too. And Yoda had different troops at the beginning of the war, too. He had red troopers, but then he goes to... Eventually, he has the green uh, corps that Commander Gree is with, um, because he's the one with... Uh, Gree is with Yoda and Revenge of the Sith. So it's a bit complicated. Not everyone has their own specific clone battalion. Some do, some don't. So I honestly don't know. 
if you look at the colors on Kit Festo's ships, they do kind of match the color of that clone battalion, though. So it's possible that they're Kits and that they were just near, they were closer than Kit because he could have been off on some solo mission or something. I don't know. But mm-hmm. I, did, I'm, I'm, I am curious about that, too, as to what battalion they belong to and who they were with. Um, what do you think of the paint markings on, like, the lead clone trooper? Feely is his name, I believe. Um, I like him. I've always thought he was cool, his design. Yeah, I, I definitely did like it. He has sort of similar markings on the helmet to uh, my favorite clone trooper, who is one of the most underrated. His name's Denal. Do you know who that is? He's blue. Mm, He's from the final no. first. We'll get to that. Well, he he actually does do important things later, but uh, he's the one that Cad Bane impo- uh, Cad Bane pretends to be. Okay. That's Denal. Um, who he's actually my favorite clone trooper, but uh, we'll get to him eventually. He has not appeared yet. No, he has. He appeared in the the episodes I wasn't in with the downfall of a droid, Sky Top Station. He was on that. He's just one of them. Okay. He's just one of the clones there. I think he does like some interesting stuff in that episode, but nothing where they specifically call him out. But he he does appear several times with the five hundred first. He's somewhat important. But, um, anyways, they have the first approach where the the clones really want to blow up the door. Nadar Veb really wants to cut through the door, and Kitfess was like, "Come on, just just wait a second. And then he opens the yeah. door, which I thought that was kind of funny. Um. Yeah, it kind of goes to show that even though he is a Jedi, he's not a wise Jedi. Oh, no, Darv M, totally agree. Yeah. Kit Fisto is wise, and he's a Jedi Master. He's always been a somewhat wise one, but it's also kind of funny, which I mm-hmm. he's lighthearted, which shows. Um, but they go through. I love how the, <laughs> the battle droids, this is another funny moment, they specifically say, have you ever killed a Jedi? And they're like, no, me neither. <laughs> and then they die. <laughs> I thought that was just kind of funny. I'm like, is there any battle droid out there that can really be like, hey, I killed a Jedi? Like, No, because if they did, they're not soon... Uh, they're soon, like, killed Yeah, off, I was going to say, they're not... And most reports. of them... Yeah, yeah so most I of them die at the hands of Jedi I anyways. I thought that was a funny moment, though. That they're both just like, have you ever killed one? Nah, oh gosh, we're dead. I thought it was kind of weird. Uh, Viceroy said, double shifts for everybody. <laughs> Don't the clones um, run around the clock already? Well, you mean the droids? You said clones. Oh yeah, the droids. Yeah, like aren't they I would, already I would running assume, around the clock? I would assume so. I didn't get that either. I noticed he said that. I mean, maybe he meant like double the time specifically patrolling that room or something. Like instead of patrolling the entire area. I don't know. I thought that was weird, but. Not super important, but I did notice that. I thought that was odd wording. But then, hey, he's not there. And then Dooku's like, hey, this is a trap. Uh, and they're like, guess who the trap's for? And they, they go through, and they look at... This is where it starts to get interesting. A statue of a Kalish warrior holding up a head. Who could... That I really be? love these statues, by the way. Yes. These statues are really cool. Yes, and they are our first insight to the backstory of General Grievous, whose lair this belongs to. Um, yes. So the first one's him without any sight. And it like it. hints towards his background as being a part of a warrior-type race. Yeah, he's always been a warrior, and that he was mm-hmm. previously a warrior before becoming General Grievous specifically. But you see him holding up a head, and then you see him with the arm. He gets one arm, I mm-hmm. think, then two arms, and then you see... Uh, the armory that has all of Grievous's literal armor, like his face plates, his legs, all of that. Um, and that's when they realize, like, oh, because they're like, huh, this seems to be some kind of a tribute to a warrior. And then they go to the last door and see, oh my gosh, this is General Grievous's lair. So I thought that was really interesting that um, Grievous essentially is a tribute to himself. Yeah. And it also uh, kind of it, it tells the story of himself. Now, do you think that's figurative or literal? Where it shows um, the his, statues, the, yeah, how it shows him gradually, like he had one cyborg arm, then he had two cyborg arms, then he goes full cyborg essentially, like that it wasn't like it in Legends, he his ship is crashed on purpose. It's arranged by Sidious and Dooku, and then they they give him essentially the entire cyborg body so he can live, and then he's uh, be, he becomes General Grievous after that, but. In this representation, 
may, this may be more of like a philosophical, like a storytelling point for the statues. Me, it may not be literal, but the way it seems to me, and they also hint at it later, is that it was gradual and that he did it willingly. Uh, because they also mention later with the doctor droid, he's like, I don't know why you submitted to the changes. And Grievous says, no, I chose he, well, let me look, I, I specifically wrote it down. He says, I chose improvements, which makes it sound like he literally like was like, Hey, replace my arm right now with like a cyber arm. But the, like, that's how it looks. So I'm curious in Canon, whether or not that is literally how it happened, or if that's just like kind of a story they were trying to tell with the statues. I don't know. It could have been both. Like, he gradually started losing limbs, but, but then there was, like, a big orchestrated accident where, where he, he really, limbs. really needed, like, that's where fair. it's only his lungs and yeah, stuff I was. was... Say, that, that's fair, because there's a big difference between having two robotic arms and then having... He also had the mask, I think, in the, be in the beginning, although he wore a battle mask, too. Like, in one of the statues added in the mask, kind of, but it wasn't like he didn't have a neck or anything, so I don't know. If that was yeah, actually... I feel like that was more of like a mask that he put over his yeah, face. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't like... think that was like for literally supporting his life. Because but... wasn't it um wasn't it in Legends that the warrior race that he was a part of, they had masks that uh, yeah. look like General Grievous's yeah, face. Yeah, they're similar. The they're not the same. Like the sides, it's essentially just the midsection that is similar, which I still believe is also uh, that's probably still canon. I, that that they had masks like that. Like I would assume that's why he has his face that looks like that, but I don't know that. <laughs> um, but that's what I thought too. But yeah, so I think it's interesting that, that they've kind of changed that where he actually chose improvements as it goes along in canon. So that was interesting. Um, yeah. we'll get a bit, we'll get into that a little bit more later though. Whenever the, I said the droid mentions that on whether or not he actually chose it. Um, um. Uh, Kit Fisto actually says a quote that I really, really loved. It says, uh, those who have power should restrain themselves from using it. It's a really good quote. Yeah, I like that. Um, and it also really also the, the soundtrack, um, it kind of reminds me of the soundtrack of Alien Covenant, which wasn't a very, um, uh, it wasn't a very liked movie, but I thought it was all right. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Uh Yes, I can't remember that. You, well. you know what I'm referring to, like the little, um, the weird little noises in the music. Uh huh. I did like the sound. Kind of. Them, though. Yeah, it, it was kind of like had a little bit of a horror movie mm -hmm. sound to it. Um, but then we get so then we get this is where things start to heat up because that was our cool little backstory which I like. Then mm -hmm. things start to get intense. Um. We get Dooku is like saying, you know, you keep failing because he, he's calling Grievous in the ship as he's pulling in, basically. And he's like, you know, you keep failing. Uh, we need you to really like step up your game. You're not really winning anymore. Like we're starting to lack faith in you. Why you're in? Uh, why you're in charge of this entire army? Because um, Dooku isn't. It is Grievous. Like Grievous is the one leading the war. Dooku is the one manipulating events. But Grievous is the one like literally. He's the one in charge of the war. Uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. forget that. Like, Grievous was essentially the Republic's main enemy, not the Sith. Like, Dooku was manipulating events, but Grievous Yeah, that's was... why they say in uh, Episode 3 that if with his death could end the war. Yeah, because... That's why they say that. I was going to say, Dooku was not the leader of the army. It was Grievous. A lot of people don't understand that, which it's like, Grievous is a lot more important than you think. Um, mm -hmm. He's an... In I love him as a character, but he's also way more important than people give him credit for. But this is Dooku saying, like, we're doubting it, and he's setting up. He doesn't tell Grievous this, but he's going to test him. Um, so Grievous walks in. He's wearing the cape, which I always, always love when he's wearing the cape because he looks so cool with it. Um, and then, he, but he also, oh, also the line is he says, like, you expect me to beat Jedi, but all you give me is battle droids. Just pointing out yeah. that battle droids are garbage, and he does have a somewhat valid point. But um, then I said, like, he's wearing the cape, super cool. And he, he walks in, he's just like, what the heck? He's, he's like, where are my guards? Like, why, why are my guards not out? Like, man, they're slacking. Uh, and then he's like, where's my pet? And then yeah, he gets I ambushed by Cologne and Jedi. Oh, yeah. Does he let that thing walk around his lair? Because he calls out to his pet as if it would have been walking around freely. I mean, like, I Does he be, just have that walking around freely? I wouldn't freely? be surprised because... If you take into account, it's probably used to droids. 
So, it, you know, it probably won't kill the droids. Maybe it would. I don't know. But I think it's reasonable to assume that it wouldn't kill the droids. But if it's his pet, it might actually like him. Yeah. It's reasonable to assume because later he gets emotional over it. Like, I think he actually has a bond with that pet. Like, I, and because seeing as how grievous well, is like, any kind of pet monster. that you keep, you kind of get a bond with. Yeah. So. And I, I feel like that they literally, also, there's no way that thing could kill Grievous because Grievous is a beast. I'm just pointing that yeah. out there. Like, it, it's cool, but like, it, Grievous would destroy it if it ever tried to kill him. So I feel like Grievous is safe. So I honestly wouldn't be surprised because there's no other living beings around there other than Grievous. Like, yeah. everyone else is a droid. So I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I have um, something to point out before we actually get to the battle between the clones and Grievous. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Before he actually gets there, they find the trophies of General Grievous: the Padawan ponytails and the lightsabers. Yeah. Um, is that to imply that he's only ever killed Padawans? No. And like they no, kind no. of, I don't. Think they kind so. of imply that at the end because. Um, uh, uh, Dooku assumes that he killed Kit Fisto, yeah. and he's like, "This is a big achievement." As if he like kind of making it sound like, like saying it's he, impressive. I'm I'm almost certain he's killed Jedi Knights before. He has in Legends, but I'm I'm almost certain he's killed Jedi Knights. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, in all fairness, Nadar Reb is a Jedi Knight when he kills him too. So, but I I, I I think it's pretty reasonable. You do see Padawan. Uh, Raids there, but I'm almost certain that he's 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 killed Jedi Knights because he wouldn't have the reputation of what he does if he hadn't if he only killed Padawans. Like I feel like that would be like oh you just kill kids essentially. Like I don't think he'd be as widely feared. I think he'd be just as hated, but he wouldn't be as feared. Whereas pe people are legitimately afraid of him. So I feel like it's reasonable to assume he's killed Jedi well, Knights. Well, to be to but... be fair, I feel like the fear aspect will still be there because oftentimes people don't really make the distinction between Padawans and Jedi Masters. They just think of the Padawans and the Jedi Masters as just Jedi, Jedi you know, in general. But the, the, the Jedi are also cautious of Grievous several points throughout the series too. So... I think well, it's I mean, cool. it, also in all fairness, I feel like the Padawans are are. What what uh, trophy would Grievous keep from a Jedi Knight other than their lightsaber? Because they don't have braids, like you know what I'm saying. I don't know. Like exactly, like that's what I'm saying is that like it makes sense that he keeps the Padawan braids, but like for a Jedi Knight, well, for example, Nadar Reb, the only real trophy there is is the lightsaber. Like he doesn't have a Padawan braid to take. So you know what I'm saying? Like I feel like there being Padawan braids doesn't mean that's the only. Jedi he's killed, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I did notice um, that, that there was a lot of Padawan braids. Um, but then we get then we get the whole battle, which is really cool. Also, it's, it shows that Grievous taken completely by, by surprise, and he still, he, he does just fine. I mean, he, he gets beat up, but in all honesty, he got ambushed by several clones and two Jedi, one of which was a master, a Jedi Knight and a Jedi Master. He holds mm -hmm. his own uh, against all of them. They even rip off his legs. He keeps going, kills several of the clones, um, and even as he's escaping, gets shot in the face and just keeps going. He's a bit of a beast. Yes, that was, that was full-on beast mode. He just keeps going. I'm like, wow, that was awesome. Uh, N Nadar Veb says something that's kind of... Weird for a Jedi to say. He says, "Don't make me destroy you." It kind of reminds me of uh, Anakin's line Anakin, in Episode okay. Three: yeah. "Don't make me kill you." Yeah, um, he's very. It's a really dark thing for a Jedi to say. He's he comes off that way, and I, that like that's how he, yeah. that's what I was saying is that he comes off as very aggressive over and over again. And in all fairness, when you take into account that killing Grievous would literally end the war. It's kind of reasonable. Like I know that, like the the Jedi yeah. way, like it, it is like questionable for the Jedi way. But like, if you really do take into account that, like killing General Grievous ends the war, honestly, Nadar Veb is probably a bit more right than Kit Fisto in this episode. In it kind of makes me also wonder why would um, Count Dooku make this as a trap for him? Like, obviously, it's either – there's two scenarios that could come of this. Either General Grievous is killed and um, uh, the war ends, but why would he set him as I mean, a, like – this well, is this is early enough. I think that he was pretty sure that Grievous would win, and he just needed to do this to prove it. 
to like I feel like Decidious, even though that's not stated. I feel like that's who you really need to prove it to, but I don't know. Um, but I feel like if if he did die, even though I'm I'm almost certain that he knew Grievous was gonna win, he just needed to show like, hey, Grievous might have had some losses, but he is not you know pointless. Um, but I do think that uh, this was early enough in the war that they probably could have gotten someone else, maybe. Maybe for Duke. I don't know though. In all honesty, I think it's. I feel like it's mainly Duke who knew that Grievous was going to pass, but I don't know. I don't know honestly. That is that is an interesting thing to point out. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, um. But yeah, go ahead. He dominates, and then we meet the sassy doctor. <laughs> yeah. Our, our... That's that's literally my next uh, note too. Are all droids like that? Because a lot of them are. I feel like all the droids that in, that are individuals are, if you know what I mean. Like there's no other version of that medical droid that we ever see. So like, yeah, he has personal. Like you know what I'm saying. Like whenever yeah. it's a droid that isn't one that we see widely manufactured, they have personality. Sort of like K2SO. We know that there are others of him. But there's only one that we see constantly that is K2SO. Um, so he has personality. Same thing with C3PO. There are other Another thing there, to but... take into account with personality wise, the longer they keep their memories, the more of a personality they Form. have. And because they allowed uh, K2SO to keep his memories, he kind of has a different personality than any of the other of his make and model. Yeah, also, I mean, you know that he is an Imperial droid, right? So. Of course, he is pretty different from the others of his make and model because he's not Imperial. Yeah, but, that's but no, I know what you're saying. That. But uh, also, did you know? Just side little fun fact: uh, it is, I believe, canon because it was in a comic book that I'm pretty sure is canon. It was about C-3PO getting his red arm. Um, for oh, this is all the way towards Force Awakens. Um, that droids can kind of remember their memories after they're wiped. Like C-3PO kind of remembers the prequel. They describe it as like a phantom limb type thing. Where they really don't have it, but they can kind of feel it. And if they really wanted to dive into it, they probably could figure it out. Which, in all honesty, if droids are that complicated, it makes sense that they probably have it somewhat stored away in there somehow. Like, they're insanely complex. It makes sense that somehow he does remember. But It kind of makes sense in real life, too. Because whenever you delete files on an actual device... Those files aren't just immediately gone. Like, you can actually go back and the only way that it actually ever disappears is if the, the thing runs out of space and they have to write over the deleted stuff. Yeah. And so, so like, it is canon even, that even so. actually C3UPO kind of remembers the prequels. He doesn't mm-hmm. outright, he only, he only has glimpses. So he kind of remembers them, but he doesn't ever fully dive into it, which I think would be really interesting. Like, what if he dove into it and then realized it? Like, what if whenever Vader found him, he, like, said something like, I know who you are, or, like, Padme loved you. Like, what? I, d- side tangent, though. But well, just if, very interesting if he remembers that, I don't – If it, it's, like, a very faint memory. I don't know if he would no, that's what I'm know saying. enough it's a, it's to a, say it's, something. No, no, it's a faint memory, but that's what I'm saying. He never dived into it. Like, if he, he – I think they kind of make it clear that if he had dived into it, which he doesn't want to because he knows those memories are bad, but um, if he dived into it, he probably could remember those things. So if he had done that is what I'm saying. So he did eventually – like, if, if he had done that, so alternate universe, like, what he could have done, like, he could have actually kind of reached out to Vader. Like, that would have been interesting. I don't know, though. Hmm. But – Side, side Knowing C three PO, I don't know how well that yeah, would work out. Yeah, I agree, but still, there's an emotional connection. I don't know. Um, next thing I have, though, speaking of droids, is R six is smart. Uh, the clones <laughs> in the shuttle get blown up, and R six is like, "I'm out of here." <laughs> it's just. Woo. I, I do have a question about that, though. Yeah. They blow up the the transport, right? Yeah. Why don't they do the same with the Jedi fighter? Um, I, like they chose my, to slowly walk up to it, allowing it to get away. Like it seems a little. It is convenient. Insane. I also think it's because it was probably closer to the Magna Guards. Like it seemed like they were right there, because I don't think it was right by the ship. Like I think he was able to see it, but I don't think that R six and the the fighter were literally right by the shuttle. So I think that the Magna Guards essentially walked out near it, and they're not going to blow up something that's right next to it, if you know what I mean. But in all honesty, it's mainly because. Kit Fisto needs a ship to escape later. So there's that. 
Uh, but yeah, and then R6 gets out of there. Um, my next note is the cracked mask is cool. Grievous with the cracked mask because you get to see him sitting in the chair and stuff. I like that. I just think that's cool with the eye kind of shot out. I think that's pretty. It, it looks cool. Uh, next thing, Gort is cool. Man, I wish we got more of Gort. I liked Gort. He was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually a really brutal killing of the clone. Gort. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, of, of well, Gort or but, the clone? Both, honestly. Both. Both. But, like, they actually, like, take off limbs and stuff. And yeah, they cut off both of his arms. It's a really then, brutal killing. Yeah, and then stab him in the head. Uh, but I, well, I thought it I was wanted, the neck. Well, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Um, why didn't Nadar Veb cut off its tail before oh, because... it slammed Feely down? Because he did it this after he slammed Feely down. He's like, oh, now I could cut off the tail. Like, now that he's killed him, let me cut off the tail. Like, why didn't he just do that? I beginning? kind of feel like he cut off the tail in a, in a moment that he... Only in a moment that he could. I don't think uh, he could before then. It was like, it, he waited until he could actually get close enough to do it. I don't think he could before... Uh, I don't know. I felt like it was basically like he just waited till he smashed it. Down. Yeah, I just I, don't know. I just looked. Um, he was knocked down, and he was in the process of getting getting up. up. I did that. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Whenever um, he slammed it. Oh, but then, we, but actually, before the whole fight with Gort, we get that little thing that we kind of already mentioned a bit. But uh, the doctor droid says, "I don't understand why you submitted submitted to the changes." And Grievous says, "I yes. chose the improvements." So he says, "Submitted to the changes versus chose the improvements." Very interesting, because that's almost like saying, "Hey, you know his legend backstory." Uh, yeah, we're kind of ditching that. Like that's what the droid is kind of alluring. So I'm curious which is true, because you could almost make it out that because we know so little right now. Either could be mm-hmm. true in all honesty, and that Grievous is kind of just like denying it, or there is the fact that in Legends they also did somewhat alter his brain. So it's possible they altered his memories of it slightly. So they think that so he kind of thinks that he chose it, whereas they well, he didn't. Like they literally mm-hmm. did alter his brain in Legends. So I'm curious if that which is true because you do get that conflicting the wording and how it really went, and he doesn't really argue with him either. So I just thought that wording was very interesting. Uh, but then you get the emotional reaction that he gets. He gets angry when Gort dies. Yes, he does. Uh, which I thought was nice. Well, not nice, but you know what I mean. Like that shows, like he he actually cared about something. I think that's literally the only moment that you maybe would have the littlest, littlest bit of sympathy for Grievous, other than if you look mm-hmm. at his backstory. But we don't get that anything more than that than what we got so far in the Clone Wars. So. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's like probably his only real sympathetic moment. Uh, and that it's kind of sad that Grievous actually had an emotional connection to something and it dies beginning of the Clone Wars. So, <laughs> just saying, it's kind of sad. Um, then we get Nadar. He kills those Magna Guards fast. Yeah. He's angry. He was determined, though. Yeah, he was angry, but, like, man, he also bisected one in half, like, not Darth Maul style, other way. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was very interesting. Um, with his death, I actually, the, I alluded to this earlier, and this is kind of the reason why I like him so much. Mm -hmm. Even though he's misguided and he's doing it because he's young and brash and stuff like that, but I feel like this was, because there's a purpose to this, it, it allows, um, Kit Fisto enough time to get away and to, uh, get out of the facility. I feel like this, his death and his him, even though he's misguided, I feel like that was the will of the Force to have him do that and to have him die. Do you? In all honesty, I kind of saw it as just... Because it other. served a purpose. Did it, though? Yeah, it allowed Kit Fisto to get away because if, uh, if both of them went in there, um, then Grievous could have just taken out his lightsabers and cut through the door and killed them. Would he have? But what would he have killed both Kit Fisto and Adar Veb at once? Do you think he would have? I mean, I don't think that he would just immediately kill both of them. But no, like, I'm saying, would... like, do you think he would have won that fight? Like, if if Kit Fisto and Adar Veb would have had the chance to fight him, 
together. Although, in all fairness, he did dominate them earlier in the episode, so I do think that's fair. Yeah, I so, don't know if they could. I don't know. That is interesting. I also think this is interesting that this isn't the only time we are going to see uh, Kit Fisto interact with the Mon Calamari. That is his species, right? Yes, I think so. I think so. And that's the species because it's Admiral Akbar, who we will see in this series, literally mm -hmm. with Kit Fisto also. So I find that very interesting. I'm I'm curious if that was on purpose, that his Padawan was that species, because we see him literally interact with that species later in the Clone Wars. So, mm -hmm. just a neat, neat little thing that I noticed, just kind of remembered just now. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Now that you put that point that out, that is kind of interesting. I don't know, though. I do have another question, though. How did Kit Fisto get out of that room? Because as far as we know, there's only one way into that room. Uh, and Grievous was standing in the doorway whenever he got out. Yeah, we don't know that there isn't another way out. And in all fairness, he has access to all the security and, like, security doors, cameras, and everything. So I feel like he could lock extra doors, unlock doors that he needs, stuff like that. Like, I feel like there's a sense, like, if there was a way to get out, he would be able to see it from there. But honestly, we don't know enough about the control panel and stuff like that. So I don't know. Uh, but either way, he does make his escape, even though he really doesn't leave until after Grievous killed Nadar Veb. So I don't know how much he really delayed it anyways. You know what I'm saying? Like, Nadar Veb was dead, and Kit Fisto was still in the room, essentially standing where he would have been standing where if Nadar Veb hadn't stayed behind. I guess. But I do see what you're saying. But yeah, now that I think about it, like, he didn't leave while Nadar Veb was fighting him. So, really, I don't know how much time, extra time he got. Um... And then what else? And so, then, yeah, he gets in... So, uh... Wait... I'm trying to think of something. Okay, so uh, Grievous got another lightsaber, but then he does, he fights Fisto later when he loses. Although then I have the question, because Fisto says this, is, Duke, is Grievous just a pawn? Because we discussed how important Grievous actually is, and also he actually does, like, respond with sass. I don't want to say sass, but he does, like, kind of rebel against Dooku several times already we've gone over. Where he just hangs up on Dooku, like, where he's like, I don't care. Where he shows defiance, mm -hmm. like, so how much of a pawn is he? Like, I know that in the grand scheme of things, like he is the emperor's pawn essentially, but is he really just Dooku's pawn? Because I feel like he does show defiance to Dooku enough that, like, yeah, he kind of is like his own person. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it could also be that Kifiso is just trying to get into his head, oh, and no, no, or no, I, I, it was a misconception that he's a pawn. I think it was both, but it just raised the question for me as to, like, whether or not he literally is, like, whether or not that statement is true. I, I am well aware that I think it is both Duke, he was trying to say that to, A, get Grievous mad, and B, I think he also was somewhat under the misconception that that is entirely true, whereas I don't think it's as true as he thinks. But this is the outside thing. Um... Then we have... Oh, yeah. Why why don't the Magna Gods use their rocket launchers um, whenever Kid Fosto's riding away and there's no air defenses or anything? after? He, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, they shoot down ships earlier, but they do not shoot down Kid Fisto ships, which I just thought was interesting. Like, it's not even like, oh, they shoot at him, but he is a good pilot. Like, the droid's a good pilot, so they don't hit him. Like, no, no one fires a shot. Just interesting. Um, but the fight itself, interesting with... Grievous. Also, I mentioned that we see Kit Fisto later. He gets the lightsaber back of Nadar Vebs. Does he use that later? Like, does he use two lightsabers so. later? I can't remember whether he just has the green lightsaber whenever we see him again, or if he has both a green and a blue. As far as I remember, he only has the green one. Okay, that, that's probably right. I just couldn't remember if he actually does use that again or not. I think it's important to point out, because we saw all those extra lightsabers, and he already had his just, four lightsabers on him, mm -hmm. even if he loses one. Oh, no, no, he has way more than that. We already know that from the lair. Yeah. But, yeah, I just thought it was interesting that Kit Fisto got it back. And, yeah, I ch Huh, that's interesting, actually. I, I looked at... I just looked up Kit Fisto underwater, and most of the shots show him with just a green lightsaber but, lightsaber, but I also see one of him in his underwater gear, which is him, like, shirtless with basically shorts and wrist gauntlets. And uh, mm -hmm. it shows him with a blue lightsaber. But most of the shots, like, from the episode are him with a green lightsaber. But there's one with him with a Were there light. other Jedi in that episode? 
I think so. I don't remember who though, but they, I, I think don't it, know. Yeah, we'll, it's we'll Anakin, Anakin, Anakin's in that episode. They're underwater. Like he has underwater gear, yeah. but yeah, I just thought we'll, it was we'll get to that episode. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, that is interesting that I've just saw one shot with him with a blue lights here. But anyways, yeah, we'll get to it. Um, so I think that's a, honestly about it for this arc, right? Yep. Or do you have anything else? Nope. So I, say that, I think we covered everything. Yeah, the arc gets better as it goes on. Uh, I'd say that, as we already mentioned, best episode of uh, season one, without a doubt for me at least, yes. is, is the Lair of yeah. Grievous. It offers intriguing backstory, uh, really awesome fights. Like It's it's just really good all, all, all around. So while season one in its majority is skippable, this episode is not. Don't skip this episode. And you honestly don't need to watch the rest of the arc for this episode. You can watch the... If you really want to watch the first episode, you can. Like we said, it's not as bad as we thought, but we went in with zero expectations. Second episode isn't bad. It's good. It offers some interesting Ventress uh, moments. But then the third one, that's where it's at when it gets to Grievous. So take that as you will. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. about, about it for this episode of Holocron Herald. As we mentioned earlier, check out our other shows like TF Primecast, which we'll be recording this week. Um, also, Steel City Bots, that's our other, that's our main Transformer show, um, which I am also on. I'm trying to think. Also, the new episode of Misaligned, that is also returning this week, and hopefully Awesome Asylum will be returning this week as well. So, Definitely keep your eyes peeled for all that nerdy geek talk. Uh, you can look that up on YouTube. That's our channel. Or any of your favorite podcast places. Uh, Apple Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, all that good stuff. Um, social media-wise, you can find Luke, who isn't here, at DarthSand66 on Twitter. <laughs> uh, you can find John. Where can you find John? John, where can we find you? on uh, At Darth underscore Forge on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then you can find me at Eric Crowbar on Twitter or at Aramis Prime on Instagram. I'm pretty active on both. And so, yeah, if you like this show, make sure to share Nerdy Geek Talk and this show if you want, specifically with your friends on social media, all that good stuff if you like it. And, yeah, thanks for listening. I think that's about it. Bye. Bye.